Peggy's peers met in 1937 and began their romantic relationship two years later. They lived together from then on until Britain's death 37 years later in 1976, first of all in the States, then at various locations in Suffolk and in London. For the majority of this time, their relationship was illegal, until the summer of 1967 when the Sexual Offences Act was passed, which partially decriminalised homosexuality, they lived under the threat of exposure and possible prosecution, especially in the 1950s when there was a series of high-profile arrests of homosexual men, including John Gielgud and Lord Montague of Bewley. Britain and Piers managed to keep under the radar, yet at the same time their relationship was effectively an open secret. And certainly, their lives were utterly entwined, both domestically and professionally. In the archive at the Red House, their final home in Aldborough, there is a huge collection of materials relating to this shared life. Obviously, documents their lives as professional musicians and uh, Britain's career as a composer, but it also goes a lot deeper than that into fleshing out their their domestic life together here at the Red House. There are numerous boxes of of receipts which were gathered together, presumably for tax purposes. This is just one of them. As gay men operating at a time when uh, their relationship was illegal, however, there was an extra layer of constraint. Uh, notably, for example, they had no property in common and they could never have a joint bank account. This would have been breaking cover too much. Um, so the house here is in Britain's name, their London base was in Piers's name, and at the end of the financial year sometimes documents survive in which we see them calculating how much time they've spent at Britain's house, how much time at Piers's flat, and how much money each owes the other for rent and living expenses. Um, we can see other little examples of how they were able to negotiate the, the constraints of uh, a straight society in, for example, their hotel bills, where occasionally, when you look at them, we see them sharing a room, uh, again, years before the 1967 Act. In some cases, this is in locations where you might expect, like they do it in Amsterdam, for example, where presumably in 1960 anything goes. Um, but they're also doing it in Beverly, in the East Riding, which is not what one would highlight as a notably rock and roll town. Um, there are all these little accommodations and negotiations that they have to do uh, to live their life and to achieve the sort of cosy domesticity that we see documented in the receipts. There's that extra layer all the time. Ne sai, chi so, che tu sai, chi so, ne so, a che più indugio a salutarci o mai. Britain and Piers' correspondence documents their lives together. Uh, we have the surviving letters here in the archive, and they begin round about 1937, when Britain and Piers first met, or well, not long after they first met, and concludes in 1976, shortly before Britain's death. We have 365 surviving letters, and obviously they're full of affection, uh, the affection that existed between Britain and Piers, but they also talk about fairly mundane things as well, uh, the sorts of things that, that couples would talk about, uh, like meeting one another, or uh, arranging travel, or purchasing various items. Uh, as I say, it's pretty much as most married couples would talk about. And they did actually describe themselves within the letters as a married couple. Uh, they address each other uh, in very affectionate terms, as you'd expect, uh, just like any adoring couple. And they use terms like, darling honeybee, my darling pea, my own darling poppet, dearest bunch, or even my heart. Uh, they're very interesting to read because not only do they talk about Britain and Piers' own lives, but they really talk about the, the, the life and times in which they lived through. So they're interesting historical documents. And um, happily, they now actually have been published. And they tell the story of this extraordinary relationship which lasted for nearly 40 years. The 
correspondence between Britain and peers, as well as their receipts, bank statements and other documentation relating to their domestic life, show a complete and often very touching picture of how they lived together and also how they were forced to live discreetly. But they were both very public people. Piers was a singer, Britain was a well-known composer and often a performer himself. They often appeared together in performance with Britain at the piano or conducting and Piers singing. Um, but they weren't really a public couple, nor could they be. Britain wrote a huge amount of music for Piers to sing. Piers was his muse above anyone else uh, throughout their lives together. Uh, there are countless songs and major roles in nearly all of Britain's operas. And a number of Britain's works are surprisingly bold in their depiction of male-to-male -male romantic love. There's Billy Budd, which is an all-male opera featuring effectively a love triangle between three men. There's the Michelangelo sonnets written in 1940, settings of Michelangelo's very romantic poetry dedicated and written for a man. And there's Britain's Canticle One, composed in 1947 with its refrain, I my best beloved am, so he is mine. And this was premiered in 1947 uh, by, with Britain at the piano and Piers singing. And it was written very much as a love song for Piers to sing. Uh, but nobody at the time reviewing it or writing about it seems to have noticed this. Uh, it may be that they were too polite to say or perhaps didn't really appreciate that that was what was going on. But it is one of Britain's most romantic songs and is definitely written with Piers in mind. Given how discreet Britain normally was, these pieces are surprisingly bold choices, um, but it seems that even though he was forced to keep his sexuality private, at times through his compositions he did allow the truth to emerge. He gives me